Yeah, we're now on the time to start our afternoon session. And uh, you know the people's dates, the themes, and the format <laughs> of the sessions. You said it was PPP. <laughs> Many times, uh, it is uh, very, very intriguing issues. From my observation of uh, about 20 years of work in the field of procurement, PPP is uh, much, much more you know, uh, interesting to many people than the conventional procurement. Uh, and this is what is happening uh, for the past couple of years. Quite, quite, quite interesting, both the public sector and the business sector and the consultancy services. They make huge money. And uh, I hope you enjoy this session. And first of all, allow me to congratulate to Professor Gaspar Vapika and the university and the students for this wonderful image. And my gratitude to the university and Professor Gaspar Vapika to invite me to give me this opportunity to chair this session. And I hope you enjoy it. And PPT and the issue has you know, was touched upon in the morning sessions, both the innovation procurement and and uh, contract management. And in this very session, we will focus on particular issues of the PPPs. I understand our two distinguished speakers will cover the particular issue of risk allocation, uh, you know, mitigation from uh, both the uh, theoretical and uh, practical perspective. And I uh, understand from the format uh, of the, this conference, each speaker allocated uh, about 30 minutes of well, their presentation. And uh, following that, we have uh, you know, questions and answers. I hope you join First of all, please let us invite Professor Chris Bobis to deliver his presentation. Chris, please. Thank you very much. And uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's uh, an honor, a privilege, and a true pleasure to be in Roma to regard the university amongst yourselves about friends and experts in procurement and in education. I was uh, privileged enough to be involved uh, many years ago with Professor Pigger and Jan Gerhold for the bank to conceptualize the entire uh, master's program, the education and procurement, and I'm delighted. I'm emotionally delighted to, to see such a progress, such a phenomenal impact of the master's program in international, national, regional, and also institutional changes and procurement across the world. So it's with pleasure today, I will speak on something quite boring. Uh, I'll be speaking on something which is not, as my chairman says, a continuation of the themes that we had this morning on PPPs, on engagement, on aspects such as professionalization of procurement, but something that is like a virus. It's dormant in any contractual relation. And I refer to risk. Risk exists in any human economic relations since the beginning of the inception. Specifically in public contracts, risk is there. It's always there. But we never bothered to mention anything. Risk was the forgotten child. We never bothered 25 years ago to even talk in academic conferences, in practice, in court proceedings about risk and its allocation and its treatment. Until something happened. And that something happened was a revolution in terms of the two areas that changed the public procurement interface. One was the event of the French insistence of trusting the private sector to deliver public services. Yes, believe it or not, France is a serious player in trusting PPP into a modality of delivering public services. They have what they have affirmations, they have concessions. They invented the concession. 80% of public services in France are through concessions. 
period. They created the best practice and the blueprint of concessions across Europe and across the world. So the first time was that, that they recognized that the French insistence of putting concessions into the procurement system since the 70s and 80s, we had two or three articles, very generic, which is good, to have concessions in works to allow the concessionaire to exploit a specific concession over a period of years. Good. Then they came to the UK. I know there's a bit of a problem at the moment with the UK, but they came uh, 25 years ago and said, we're going to take concessions a step further. They created a concept called PFI, Private, Private Finance Initiative. So they not only brought the concept, the best practice of the French affirmation, the French concession, to the front, but they created a system where the private sector finances, not delivers through a concession model, but finances, brings the finance. Therefore, you have a huge change in terms of delivery method. The time period for a concession or a PPP or a PFI comes into decades, you know, three, two, three decades, easily. Whereas the normal contract expire probably in a year or two years max. So you will see the first impact of the change. And since change is something we like to expand, both lawyers and economists. And this is what my experiment with change is. My change, my experiment with change is focusing on a risk. Allow risk because risk is not a concept that is being not only researched but is not being treated with the same academic respect of other procedures, substance, or other issues on contracts or procurement have been um, treated with. Risk is a big concept that can destroy contracts. In fact, is what we call it. Quite often I use that terminology in court procedures. Uh, a risk is uh, like a feline. It's like a cat, but like a big cat, like a tiger. It can eat you. You can go and pet it, but don't go too far because the moment you try to trust risk, that's the moment that the risk will take you. And I'll prove you. Risk in public-private partnerships happen because not only the period for delivery and engagement is there, not only because of the financing modality is changing than the traditional public contract, but quite often because through risk we have the public, the end user, you and I, paying for the service. So the whole thing changed. Let's see how it translates into something that we're trying to research. I started with a concept as an academic because I have also some love affair with practice, institutional and private practice. I started with categorizing risks, codifying risk. The economists love that. And my friends, my economists love me because I love that methodology. Categorizing, categorizing risk focuses on mainly three theories. The first is transaction costs economics. The second is the principal agency theory. And the last is what we call this morning incomplete contracts, something that we haven't contemplated using in the public sector. Incomplete contracts. We leave something for some later on to devise the outcome of the contract. The outcome of the perceived, uh, the outcome of this categorization is a concept called perceived risk. What you as a private sector, what I as a public sector perceive as risk. That what counts. This is the end of the so-called categorization. What's your perception of risk? What's my perception of risk? If they meet, if they coincide, we have equilibrium. We have something that we can build, something we can treat risk. And where we can treat risk? Where we need to find risk? The contract. Simple as that. No matter where you're looking for, risk is in the contract. Don't look further. Take the contract and you will see through the contract risk. 
The problem is, who is going to look for it? Quite often, the lawyer will look for risk. But most probably, the lawyer is useless in understanding risk. Therefore, you need the economist to come and put a price tag, put something which quantifies risk into a contract for its treatment. Remember what I mentioned to you, risk exists, it's a dormant, it's a virus concept in any contract. The lawyer will identify, this is risk. Who is gonna treat it is the economist. Because he has the brain power, the training, the treatment of understanding pricing of the risk. And that is conceptually, fundamental, important into an outcome of the exercise. I've done approximately 160 complex PPPs since 2008 until today. Somebody will say, Chris, you choose the complete wrong period because 2008 until today, we have uh, what we call a, a big recession or a big problem. So maybe the uh, readings, they're not so accurate. Well, I contest that and I say, well, we can see more accuracy because the Screws are so tight. The financial screws are so tight because of the, concept of the recession. Therefore, you can see elevation of risk more prominent. I found the following risks through categorization. The first is relation and representation risk. This is where probably the aspects of the contract, the two parties, the public and the private, in any partnership, will fight for their interest. Representation and relations. That covers everything around their own perceived risk for interests, their self-interest. The second concept is the performance risk. You heard this morning, you will hear later on, you've done in your practice, you've done in your profession, performance is everything. How can you perform as a private sector, as a contractor, how you can perform as a public sector, as a procurer? So performance risk is not only the deliverables, but also what we call it the KPIs, the magnificent sets of day-to-day -day improvements on the delivery of the contract. Another type of risk, and this is again what the economists have a, a feast in researching, is finance risk, the financial risk. It's important because in the PPP, in a concession, in the PFI arrangement, is the private sector that comes with the money. In fact, it's a consortium and a third party called the bank that will come with a big check and huge rights, quite often quite intrusive rights called step-in rights to go into a partnership and drive everything away, supposedly when the risks are turning against them. So that category called finance risk. And the last thing, the last type of risk I categorize, and you like it because most of us were here with some kind of lawyers, is something we call contract risk. In normal contract procurement, you have a project management. You get somebody dedicated on the part of the contracting authority, on the part of the private sector to manage the project. They're obsessed, they leave the breathe of the contract, and they're happy when everything is going to plan. But nobody, and I repeat again, nobody manages the contract. Contract management, it's something quite novel. Because the contract is a document that upon signature, it will go to the bottom of the drawer. Nobody will look at it unless you take it to the judge, unless you take it to a court. The contract is the forgotten document in any relationship. So in my point, in my research, and also in my writings, I find quite often that there is a concept called contract risk. What the contract is saying about potential conflicts, potential issues, who is drafting them, and the importance of the contract drafter. Who designs the contract? You put so much emphasis on procedure, on procurement, on advertisement, on selection and qualification. Very little confidence you have on whoever is gonna put the contracts together. We heard from the, the World Bank a tremendous contribution for trust. Trust comes as a kind of a partnering. 
It doesn't mean you tear the contracts apart and you have a charter, one page charter that you promise that you're gonna love your partner. That's not the case. Partnering means common goal, setting, starting, and finishing from a common position for drafting the contract to protect each other's mutual interests, to create a pain and gain, to creating a system for incentivization. This is what is coming as a big pool, as a big cluster of contract risk. This is what I found. I created a kind of a spine, like a dinosaur, and you see in the spine some serious discs. Imagine, you know, you're in a natural museum and you see a big dinosaur, and you see from the head all the way to the tail some discs. Well, these are the spine discs of the contract. And I found out over the 60 contracts I examined, collectively around 65 to you know, 80 billion euro contract value, I found approximately 20, sorry, 32 spine discs. The spine of a contract has 32 discs coming from the definition, the period of a contract, the order of precedence, the warranties, the deliverables, liquidated damages, I'm not gonna go through there, but you will see exactly what it I found and how they go in numerical term across the spine. Great. Look at the next step. I'm trying to find migration. I'm trying to find how risk goes from the public to the private person in the PPP. We heard before that everybody's obsessed about transferring risk. The more risk you transfer, the better you are because guess what? You're a good procurer. Somebody will take the risk for you. Yes, but not for nothing. The more risk you take, the more money you expect. Risk and payment are grammatically features. They go together up. So for representations, I found as soon as you hit drafting the contract from the very eight stages of the risk spine, you will see the public sector shifting risk across. The top horizon, the top platform of the graph, you will see the public sector migrating, shifting risk towards the public sector. The bottom section is how the private sector is replaying back. It's like a tennis, the reverse. As soon as somebody is trying, threatening to give you risk, you're not going to sit there like a duck and take the risk. You're going to kit it back because the risk will take you away. And you will see quite often in certain aspects through representation, the private sector balances, creates a kind of a equilibrium into the risk assessment mm -hmm. and migration for representation and relations. For performance, it's even heavier. The public sector is petrified on performance in PPPs. We heard before there's a rule, the jury is out for the assessment of PPPs. We know that. Everybody knows that. The commission knows that. Member states know that for value for money and also for governance issues. So initially for performance risk, you will see a massive migration flow on the part of the public sector towards the private. But the private sector has very little to take back because that's the essence, that is the concept of a PPP and a concession. The court of justice recognized to talk something like a concession, it has, has two things. The first, there must be a considerable risk transfer from the public to the private. And the second is the payment system must be different. You and I, as the end user, must pay. So in other words, in legal words, the public sector has the upper hand on transferring performance risk. And the reverse, the replay of the private sector is limited because that's the game of a concession. Au contraire, on finance risk, we have a serious game in front of us. From the very beginning for finances, we have the play set for the public sector through general terms and conditions of every contract. The non-negotiables, the payment system, the structures, the recovery, 
issues that relate into refinancing. The private sector also has a serious appetite to replay back the risk, to create as much as possible a balance in order for the finance risk not to become a performance risk. If you fail the finance risk, immediately any contract, any, let's say, the vast majority of the contracts, it will create a huge vacuum in the performance of the contract. Again, you will see in, in that migration chart that the private sector fights back, trying to balance what is the finance aspect of risk. Call it refinance or even payment system or milestones for payments or even authentication of the quality for deliverables during the process of the delivery of a complex public-private partnership. Last but not least, the contract risk migration. This is the most complex, the most complicated aspect of every PPP. This is where the lawyers make the money. This is where the good lawyer will save the public sector and the PPP from a lot of hassle in the years to come. And don't forget that the PPP will have the best part of two decades. They will outlast three or four, perhaps five governments. So a PPP is more important in time-wise than any traditional government. Depends which part of Europe you are also. You will see also that sort of migrations from the public to the private and also the public, the private sector, also hits back for some balancing requirements of the contract arrangements for risk transfer. The combined sets, the combined maps, just for only for your own eyes and probably to see how busy the traffic is, it proves that the public sector has the upper hand in the migratory pattern of risk. The reason for that, because the public sector has every risk to get the movement, to create the ball, to create the game towards the private sector. The private sector, on the other hand, is more effective. It hits more accurate in the returns of the risk transfer and migration in order to balance. Look at the amount of traffic goes from the, the upper part of the graph. The amount of traffic goes from the public sector to the private, and look at the lower axle, how the private sector responds. Relatively smaller traffic, but more effective to balance the contract. And you can ask me, how do you balance the contract? Because you sign it. If you don't sign the contract, it's not balanced. If the lawyer says you do not sign the contract because it's imbalanced or it's not correctly, properly addressing risk, nobody from the government, nobody from the private sector will sign the contract. So take that as an assumption, contractual assumption, that if a contract is signed, supposedly it's balanced. What we learn out of that? We learn two things. The risk migration is the result of what we call it risk reversion. The more risk goes from the public to the private sector, the more reversion, the more balancing need on the private sector is necessary. The reason for that is because if it's not the case, the contract will not be affordable. The PPP will be too expensive. The government needs to abort because so much risk going to the other side, there was no chance that the private sector would deliver affordably for the public. Don't forget, these are public services. The concession is not for everything but public service. The other important topic, and I'm paving the way for my distinguished friend and colleague, Elisabetta Yoste, to come, Professor Yoste, to come to tell us about more on the influencing factor of risk assessment and migration, is the three aspects I found out. And I share with you with pleasure. The first is the contract da drafter, the person, the lawyer, the person that is in charge to draft a contract, serious player in assessing risk and the migration of risk. The second aspect, the second element, is the monitoring of the contract. Don't forget the contract is a live document. You need to look at it. It breathes. It talks to you. You do not put them in the bottom of the drawer. Make it on the top agenda priority to check how the performance of the contract relates to reality. Last but not least is the judge, the enforcer, 
the national judge that is capable of taking a contract and enforcing the contract in order to ascertain the rights and duties of the parties. Very briefly, as a conclusion, I do hope that you both like public contracts, public-private partnerships and concessions as modalities, modern modalities of delivering public services. Institutional reform is trying to get as much flexibility into the system. You hear from major players such as the OECD, the European Commission, the World Bank, the Bank of Reconstruction and Development. We need more flexibility, meaning more flex into the contract. Again, the contract is the serious ground for assessing risk, performance, finance, and relations. Again, the boring contract is on the table. And the best way to learn about this is do an autopsy, dissect a contract, something that went wrong, something that went completely right. Because there are both cases. And you can learn out of where risk is sitting, where risk is transferring, and when we can learn lessons and implement lessons for the better quality of public services. Chairman, thank you very much for the opportunity. Ladies and gentlemen, I appreciate very much for your time. I'm more than happy to take any questions, and thank you very much again. God bless you. Very, very impressive. Uh, thank you very much, for Professor uh, Chris Morris. Next, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor well, Eliza Yossa, the University of Rome of Bacata. Okay, please. Um, you can put up the slides. Thanks, Gustavo, for inviting me. It's really nice to be back here. And thanks to Fugua and Chris for uh, the presentation and the interesting um, uh, uh, talk. Okay, maybe can I get the first of that? I'll try not to be hidden by the screen, I'm not as tall as Chris, otherwise I will stand up. Okay, so um, public partnerships, where do we stand? Um, let me say, I'll give a talk, 30 minutes, more or less. I uh, want to briefly discuss some trends, characteristic and rationale for PPP, uh, to then lead to, the, to, uh, to something that is strictly related to what Chris was, uh, was saying uh, on uh, risk allocation and contract design, giving some good and bad news. So suggestions on what to do, and, the, uh, uh, and if I have time, I would like to report about an interesting positive case which highlights the role and importance of institutions. So I, first of all, why are we here uh, and on why this is a main issue, because uh, you all know that you know, we need infrastructures. The OECD in 2015 estimated that the, uh, to the, the total global infrastructure investment requirements by 2030 for transport, electricity, transmission and generation, distribution, water and communication will be no less than 71 trillion US dollars. Amazing. And this is about 3.5% of the annual GDP uh, over the period 2007-2030. Now, we also know, here I refer again to the OECD, another study, that many of these infrastructures in the past have been provided by the public sector uh, but due to budget constraints and um, uh, possibly also some sort of um, uh, ideology sometimes, uh, private investments have also uh, been mobilized. But the reasons I will, uh, about this I will, be, will be discussed later. Overall, PPPs account for potentially 15% of the annual capital uh, central government expenditure around the world. So what are these PPP? I always want to give a brief definition of what I mean by PPP because sometimes there are different definitions. So I have in mind this kind of concession contracts where you find four main characteristics. So first of all, there is a bundling of project phases, meaning that the, like in the DBFO model, the design, the building before building F for finance and over operation are all bundled together in one contract with um, an SPB, a project company. So the project company becomes in charge of designing the project, building the infrastructure, financing it, and operating 
There is private finance, not 100% of it, 40%, 50%, 60%, it depends. Contracts are typically long term, so this is a long commitment. When we're lucky, it's 25, 30 years, but there are also PPPs of 80 years. Sometimes when, uh, when they're more, the service component is very important, they can last also just five or seven years. The key thing we should find in PPPs uh, is that we should see, for the reasons I will discuss later, higher risk transfer to the private sector. What, what kind of risk transfer from construction to demand to availability risk and so on. In particular, we can identify, and this is important, two different types of PPPs. The ones that are called financially freestanding, where users pay, very easy, concession type contract, highways, roads, bridges. So the, 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 the concessionaire, the firm, the SPV will design the highway, will build it, will operate it. If, it's, if users charge, he might collect the fees, um, he might pocket it or not, depending on the demand risk allocation, and he will maintain it. This is very different from what are called availability payment PPPs, where instead users don't pay. Typical example being prisons, users don't pay but still we have uh, the design, building, and operation of the prison done within the private sector, and here there are th th some shadow prices or availability payments uh, are paid directly by the uh, public sector. Availability payments are also used for schools hospi and hospitals. The, the sectors where we see these PPPs go from water, for all phase of water treatment distribution, transports, typical example being motorways, but also bridges and tunnels, airports, ports, and local public transport. So if I have time, I will discuss about local public transport case. Recycling and environment, swimming pools, sports centre, leisure centre, tennis courts, museums, uh, uh, libraries, and then hospital, prison, schools, and so on. If we look at the data, there is some data on the um, uh, EPEC uh, uh, website. Uh, so I just, uh, it's very easy to access it. If you take just the number of projects between 2010 and 2017, you find that these are the, the, the number of projects, like in transports have been 122, uh, quite a few projects in education, so schools, uh, recreation and culture, environment, and so on. Um, and, the, and in terms of value, clearly transport is the big player, that's uh, it gets up to here, but also sc uh, schools, healthcare. Uh, uh, and uh, education are doing uh, are contributing a lot. In terms of countries, looking at Europe, United Kingdom was the first who kind of rationalizes it. Uh, is one of the most uh, the countries that used public uh, PPP most. France, Turkey, Netherlands, Germany, uh, uh, Italy is here. Okay. If you look at the evolution of the market, it's interesting that this follows very much the financial crisis before and after. So you can see that it was going up and up and up, kind of countries were learning how to use this instrument. And then it reached the top around 2007 to then go down. And the reason why it went down is because it became more difficult to, to sort of get the private finance due to the financial crisis. What should we expect now? A number of commentators say it's gonna go up again. And it's gonna go up for two reasons. First, because there is more still need for infrastructure. Second, because countries need private finance, they're financially constrained, budget constraint. And third, because still there is this belief the private sector does better. Uh, so the worldwide, you can use the data set by the World Bank, uh, and, uh, and it's very interesting to see how PPPs have been used a lot also in Brazil, Mexico, and Chile, and the World Bank clearly is, is a big play here. With Stefan Sossier, we have a, a very recent paper that give you uh, more details on this sort of um, uh, where we are now. Okay, so what is the rationale? There are two slides I keep pro, uh, you know, uh, using everywhere I discuss about PPP because there is a lot of nonsense around and I get very annoyed <laughs> about this. So the rationale for PPP is, uh, you know, you hear people saying private sector is more efficient, so we should get infrastructure managed, built, and operated by the private sector. As an economist, we do research on this. This is very scientific research. It's not policy papers. You know, things have been checked and counter-checked by referees and so on. I can tell you that this is absolutely not the case. 
There is a survey by Magenson and Nette, you can check, published in the Journal of Economic Literature, which is one of the top five uh, international journals in economics, It surveys all the studies. And what it shows is that it really depends. In some countries, private sector is doing quite, quite well. In other countries, and you know, Northern Europe, the public sector works very efficiently, and they can do it marvelous. So ideal, every time you hear public private sector, we need private sector expertise, is really just ideology. Second, they say, oh, wow, we need to address public uh, budget constraint. Private finance is cheaper. This is even a bigger nonsense because public finance is typically cheaper than private finance. You need to reward the, the private sector for the risk. And also in terms of risk assessment, you know, public sector typically in the countries we are discussing, like Europe and the US is uh, a, a, um, a better borrower in terms of risk than the private sector. So again, this is nonsense. So what has gone on a lot in Europe is that the uh, countries were wanted to use PPP because the of accounting tricks, which allow them to build infrastructure off balance. I mean, basically, you could, uh, this, this started in, in the UK, I love the UK, but they were really masters at these tricks. They, 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 they sort of, uh, you know, could announce they were building infrastructures, 80 schools, 50 hospitals, everything, but the public debt will not show all the commitment because of accounting tricks. Then this has been corrected by Eurostat decisions, but this is what's going on for a while, and it still goes on a little bit. So why should we use a PPP? Are they nonsense? No, they're not nonsense, but there is a very specific reason why we should use them, and which, is, which can be summarized by this graph. And it's related to the, 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 the four characteristics of PPP I mentioned, bundling, private finance, long-term contract, and risk transfer. The four of them need to go together. So why is this? Because if you bundle design, building, and management in a long-term contract with uh, one single operator, who may then subcontract various aspects to other operators, then you are creating a single point of responsibility, okay, for everything. And this makes more uh, risk transfer to this single point of responsibility more effective on incentives. You, you know, if things go wrong in the operational stage, you can't claim, oh, this is someone's, someone else's fault. It was done in the design stage. You were responsible for the design stage as well. So it's all your responsibility. And this induces contractor to take into account how their investment at building stage, at design stage, can affect the operational cost. Okay, it can affect the management, it can affect the maintenance. So overall, this should lead to better quality infrastructures. If there are problems, they're responsible. So the idea again is that they should build infrastructures that, that are durable because they are, they're gonna have to pick up the bill when things go wrong. And so better infrastructures lead typically to better public services and also better operational management, thanks to better infrastructure, should lead to cheap infrastructures. Now, this is all related to the fact that the contract per se cannot discipline everything, because all these contracts are affected by symmetric information between the private sector and the public sector. If there is another thing I really dislike, is the fact that these are called partnerships. It's not a partnership. Everybody there is looking after their own interests, the public sector and the private sector, and only on some regards, which is to maybe just to make sure that the project is, you know, continuous, they are aligned. Otherwise, they're not. One side pays, the other one receives. Okay? However, the conflict of interest may, could, need not be a problem if things are done properly. But there is a conflict of interest in many regards, and the asymmetric information is there all the time. It's like having builders at home and not being there when they do the job. There is a problem, okay? So this idea is the potential for PPP. In practice, you know, let it, problems may arise. So the key to PPP is risk transfer, exactly as Chris was saying. Now, risk, what, are risk, what, are, what is risk? So uh, there are so many uncertain outcomes which have a direct effect on the provision of the service. They affect revenues, they affect costs, they affect social benefits. Risks in PPP can be either retained by the public authority or transferred or retained by the pro to the project company or transferred 
to the project company and then they are located to third parties like subcontractor or they can be covered by insurance or they can be transferred to end users in the sense that prices will go up when things go wrong. Now, Chris has already mentioned this, so I will be very brief. There are so many risks and categories of risk, mystification of output requirements. The public authority may say, I want A, and then realize a year and a half later, they actually they need B. Design and site risk, construction risk, time schedule risk, operational risk, demand risk. You expect two million users, and you find that there is a million and a half. Uh, availability risk, risk of changes in public needs, legislative, political, and regulatory risk. These are the governments just saying, oh, yeah, I don't like this contract anymore. I'm going to change it. No, the usual thing. A residual value risk. Now, the risk allocation affects the expected returns from the project and their riskiness. So clearly, risk allocation affects the bankability of the project. So that's one thing to take into account. The more risk you transfer to the private sector, the, the, you know, the more <laughs> they need a, a compensation for it, okay? Second, uh, the, the risk allocation affects, as I said, you know, the, the accounting treatment of the PPP, which thanks, uh, due to the Eurostat decision, you know, may affect also the legislation that applies uh, on whether it's a PPP or not. And this is the, the Aerostat decision 2008. It tells you basically that in theory, you know, we really want PPP. For, for it to be a PPP, the public company needs to bear construction risk and either demand risk or variability risk. And then the risk allocation affects incentives in the way I described earlier on. If I transfer you demand risk, then you should really think carefully when you are trying, when you are going to uh, uh, bid for for the contract, because if you expect a million users and there are going to be only five hundred thousand, you bear the consequences in terms of lower revenues. Okay, so clearly this affects also incentives to uh, identify the demand, incentives to make a, a good design, incentives to to follow good practice in operation. Now. The efficient risk allocation, as already mentioned, should not be decided on the, in order to circumvent Eurostat decisions so that projects can still be on balance. That's just wrong. It's accounting tricks to fool voters. They should not be designed, decided just in order to pass all the risk to the SPV and to free the public sector from risk. Because the more risk you transfer to the SPV, the more they're going to ask for as a compensation. Okay? And they sh you, this risk should also not be transferred just to isolate the SPV from the risk so that you can find a bank that will finance it. I'm sorry, again, this is not the way to, to allocate risk. The way is really, as I said, in order to provide incentives and to trade off these two things. The fact that you, when you transfer risk, you give incentives to the, comp to the private sector to actually forecast demand well, to design the infrastructure well, to take into account the long impact on maintenance and operational cost and so on. But at the same time, you're going to pay more for it. So trade it off. So in Europe, what we see as a government mistake, is to try to push bidders to accept all the risk. Public authority try to transfer as much risk as they can to the public authority. But a common mistake in Europe is that they don't try to push private sector to, be, to accept enough risk, in the sense that they are so concerned about bankability that they retain too much risk. Also, you know, they, this is when they signed the contract is 2010, but all the problems may arrive 7, 8, 10, 15 years later. You know, who cares? Lenders typically don't want to take risk. They want to the, the SPV, the public, set, the public company, to be an empty box. So what we see in practice, and I'm glad that Chris, uh, you know, analyzed these contracts and already identified it in a way, because it's very hard to get contract data, is there is a lot of misallocation of risk. And when there is misallocation of risk, it means you're not transferring the risk you should transfer, you're not, and you're keeping risks that you should not keep. And the problems will arise during these 25, 30, 40 years of the, of the contract. So why this is happening? What implications does this have? There is some good news. Uh, it all started when the UK National Auditor in 2003 and later 2007 
even if this data is not fully you know, um, scientific, they found that the risk transfer was successful and PPP were on, because thanks to the fact that the, you know, they were paying uh, penalties if there were delays, um, and at that time there was also the idea that uh, you know, the payment will only start during the operational stage, so any re delay in the construction will lead to no payment. The completion times of PPP compared to traditional procurement was much better. You see the dat data here, 76 instead of 30%. And the risk transfer was seem to be working better in the sense that you, they, the, over the years there will not be l many renegotiations uh, where the government had to keep paying the public sector in an expected way. Also some positive evidence with some survey data. More scientific evidence, this is really the first uh, scientific paper done on PPP, was, a, was a, a student of ours here, Tovergata, who looked at the Italian district heating. Some are done through PPP, some are done through traditional procurement. So in some cases, the contractor was building the infrastructure and operating it. In other cases, uh, the infrastructure were built by the public site and the contractor were just operating it. So the first case is the PPP. It represents 13% uh, in the last 10 years, and there is a clear externality there. The one I was describing, the fact that the better the infrastructure you build, the lower the cost or the higher the quality at operational stage. And the externality there was linked to the fact that a better network design, district heating, reduced heat dispersion and does operational costs. So we looked at the data set of 148 plants between 2007 and 13, with 750 observations using as output data, heated volume, energy production, and so on, and input data. He could actually look at the network length, labor cost, distribution of substations, so really look at the design. Mm -hmm. you Using as proxy investment in plant quality, what he found was that PPP was actually leading to better infrastructure, overall cheaper to maintain, and less heat dispersion. Okay, so really also better service. It meant users were paying less as well. 5% increase in productivity. This is actually a lot of the money. But there is a lot of bad news too. Uh, in a recent paper by Dejan and Marianne Moreau, Moreau uh, Dejan is at the OECD, Marianne Moreau is Berkeley, they report evidence on PPP where they say, you know, PPP returns are systematically and substantially as above expected return. What is the difference? The expected return is the expected revenues minus cost from the project, okay? Like, I don't know, 500,000. But when they look at you know, what was in fact that they, these firms were gaining, they found them to be 15, 20, 24% higher. In fact, the number that were found in these other studies, 24% higher. How do you justify this? The justification is very, very clear. Part of this, part of this is because too much risk maybe was transferred and they were asking for a compensation for their risk. Second, there was not enough competition at tender stage. The contracts were not drafted well, okay? So there is a problem. The bad news continues. The PPP Epic Center reported that over 90% of PPP transactions closed without any demand risk. I mean, maybe they were all availability uh, PPPs, but I doubt. And we also have a lot of evidence of renegotiation. There is a famous book by Balguash. So it's not the end. There is even more research uh, done about these re crazy revenue guarantees where the public sector first says, oh, you bear the risk. However, things go wrong. Don't worry, I refund you. This is how not to <laughs> transfer risk. So revenues guarantees were basically uh, ensuring the contractor, you know, that if the revenues were not high enough, the government will chip in. Uh, uh, there is a paper by Hemming where an, an angle where, where some of this evidence uh, is reported. But who understands about risk transfer? What is a fair rate of return for risk? Uh, uh, you know, it's very difficult for the outsiders to judge. We said 24% earlier was the premium for risk on average found in the previous study. London Underground, a famous PPP, is 18 20%. Is anyone in this room able to tell me whether this is a fair compensation for risk? Who is going to know? You need so much expertise here. What else? When we look at the signed contracts, uh, we find that 
even big institutions, and the World Bank people may correct me if I'm wrong, choose co make completely different choices. So, for example, who should bear traffic risk in a motorway? The World Bank says that traffic risk should be borne by the contractor, but the Indian government standardized contract says the opposite. What is right and what is wrong? So why there is this bad implementation in practice? I mean, this is the thing, you know, theory is wonderful, I love it, but then now it's time to really address why things are not working when they're not working in practice. Sometimes they're working, but not all the time. So the first thing is that public authority should choose PPP only when it's the, is efficient. And we said that it's efficient if there is a bigger scenario across stage, so there is transfer and bundling can provide a good incentives. Very often there isn't. What the public authorities should do, and this is how the legislators said in many countries they should operate, is before, before choosing a PPP, they, could do, they should uh, con uh, um, uh, um, construct a public sector comparator. What is a public sector comparator? They, do, they should do a study that says how much will it cost within the public, uh, if we did this infrastructure in traditional way th within the public sector instead of doing a PPP. The idea is great, you know, wow, yes. So you have the alternative and then you should go for PPP if and only if you find that the, the, the bid <laughs> at tender stage is better than that. Or you even put the public sector comparator as a reserve price in the tender. But in practice, whenever you talk to public officials over a coffee, they tell you, yes, the way it works is the following. First, we decide whether to do a PPP or not, and then we go and draft the public sector comparator in such a way that it makes sense what we're doing. Wow. Has any of you seen public sector comparators, by the way, data? So the other thing, which is really, I think, bad, Chris will me, correct me if I'm wrong, is this idea that you, you negotiate the contract after you have identified the bidder. So how does it work? It works the following. You bid on a contract with million of years at stake. You identify the best offer. Then once it's been identified, you sit with the, with the, with the bidder and say, okay, let's now decide who is going to bear the risk. It's not going to work. No way you can transfer risk then. I mean, they have made a bid having in mind the risk allocation. You can't just then go and start negotiating over something given that they must have used this information to make the bid. So this does not work. So what should we do? What we should do, I believe. First, make choices to ensure bank, the other way around, <laughs> to ensure typo, big typo, eh? so here, to ensure efficiency, not bankability, okay? Efficiency, not bankability. Public sector, oh no, these are, sorry, these are not uh, still the, what should we should do, but the things that go wrong, yes. Ma uh, these are the things that get wrong, as I said, make sure uh, choices are made to ensure backability, not efficiency. Public sector comparators po poorly calculated. Uh, the, the purpose of public officials is short term. They look at striking deals, not at the long term benefits for, for, uh, for users. They negotiate contract terms um, and risk allocation in particular, and there is an awful lack of transparency. I'm very happy Chris managed to get 65 contracts. Whenever I ask for a contract to a public authority, they tell me that is confidential. Sorry, C confidential might be the numbers, but not the contract. This should be public available, so what to do? First, I keep on saying this, I'm happy in some cases it's been heard, we need centrally designed standardized contract, centrally designed standardized contract by sector. So it should not be delegated to a single public authority what the risk allocation should be for a motorway. This should be decided centrally and public authority should be bounded by these contracts and allowed to modify them in terms of numbers, but not in terms of risk, the way risk is allocated. Whether you, how you allocate a, a, the risk for a prison should be the same whether the prison is in north of Italy or south of Italy. Second, you sh I believe that PPP cannot be dealt with by public authority at local level. You need to aggregate public authorities and ideally have a PPP expertise center at national level, provided that this one is made accountable. And how can you make this one accountable? Transparency on PPP need to be the role. Contracts need to be available online. As I said, the commercially sensible information is very limited. This should not be commercially sensitive how much this, the, the contractor is, is, pay, is being paid. 
or what its performance is. And you, once you have done things centrally, you can then compare similar contracts and do benchmarking. Of course, then you need a lot of training for PPP officials and you know, and going in the details, this is very important because these are very complex things. Very often I even happen to talk to public officials we, who were heroes and very well in you know, a mean it, meaning, but they just did not have the training. And of course, lack of training, you know, makes corruption, you know, uh, 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 the risk. The benefit of transparency have been shown for public contracts. This is, a, again, an academic study which we're looking at contracts, uh, the performance of contracts above, just a few dollars above and a few dollars below the threshold where the publicity requirements change. And you see this big drop. This big drop says when the contracts were was made public, tenders were made public and advertised, the number of big, uh, bidders was much higher than when it was not. And this is the discount offered from the reserve price to, win, uh, to the um, winner when the tender was advertised and when it was not. I bet that many improvements could be uh, uh, achieved if there was a clear commitment government-wise about transparency in, in public contracts. We use, uh, this is a final point on competence, um, we consider, we, we, we never managed to access data in Italy, and this is a very upsetting, and if there is someone from the uh, anti-corruption authority, I'm, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, something I, I remain very upset with. So even the anti-corruption authority in Italy doesn't release uh, data. This is not very good. Uh, they do it only in particular circumstances. Um, too complicated. When I get to the US website, I can get all the information about all US federal contracts online without even, you know, without having to make any requests or anything. They are online. And when I get all the data online, we found, we, we did a wonderful study published in the MBR paper where we compared, we, we calculated, we found an index of competency of all public procurers. This is not about PPP, it's about procurement. And we found a strong positive effect of competence on both time and cost performance. So we, in particular, what we found was that lifting the level of competence of all federal bureaus to, that of, to the best, the 10% bureaus, uh, which happened to be NASA Glenn Research Center, would imply a reduction in cost overrun, renegotiation by $102,000 per contract. 54 days less in delays per contract. So competence can have massive impact on performance. If I have five more minutes, yes. Okay, if I have five more minutes, I want to end with some positive news. Um, uh, the positive news comes from from um, uh, from uh, doing a study on uh, another concern I have, uh, which is, you know, all these big PPEs. We are for many of them just at the f first tender. What should we expect when the contract ends and there is a new tender? Okay, our concern, our fear as economists is that in most cases in the new bidding, the incumbent will win. So there will be no competition at tender stage. And there are many reasons why we are so concerned that there can be an incumbent's advantage, sunk, sunk costs, and so on. And this is a problem also because when we look at the performance of these first tenders, you know, that we found this is the National Audit Office data that tendering periods are very long, 5% of project value uh, is just used as transaction cost, wasted as transaction cost to prepare bids. There is very limited participation. SMEs are out of the game because the contracts are too big and too complex and, and so on. So, you know, and even now, again, in Italy, in France, there is this discussion, oh my God, we don't want to do competitive tendering because otherwise there is a, there is a, a <laughs> we're concerned that foreign firms may bid and win. I mean, the issues are big, also politically. So some policy news, uh, we, con we looked at the PPP for London bus transports. We got the data from TFL, uh, Transport for London. London buses are interesting. They are kind of a simple PPP in the sense that the private sector owns the infrastructure, the garages, 
Typically, they own the buses and then they get a gross contract to operate the service. Gross contract means that the government pays a fixed fee for them to operate the service and the government retains user fees, tickets, okay? Now, what did we do? We, we look at the contracts, the 402 routes uh, have been uh, tendered between 2003 and 2015. And for all these routes, we got all the information, the highest bid, the lowest bid, the number of bidders, and so on, who they are, and blah, blah, blah. And what did we find? We found that this is a case where the TFL, the, 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 the procurer was very clever, because at the time of moving from in-house provision to O open tender, he realized that the power of the incumbent in-house provider was too big. So what did they do? They broke it up into different, 12 different companies. They let these companies privatize, be privatized, and then they start competing. And as a result, they started with an oligopoly, not a monopoly. So even now, there are about 10 companies some are bigger than others, they're operating the buses in London, all the red buses you see when you go to London, 10 of them. Every two weeks uh, there is a, a contract for one or more routes, so there, are, there is a big division in lots, small and medium firms are happy as Larry because they can get even just, you know, a family firm can get a contract, okay, it's not just the big operator. And the winning company, when we see, is yes, it is very often the same company that got the previous contract, but in more than 30% uh, of cases, it was actually a totally new company. And we see, in fact, that the, uh, the average number of bidders is, is three, and that somehow uh, firms win. Uh, competition over time. We were concerned about what's happening over time, so we look at the way prices are changing over time. Between the first and the second ten, they're obviously adjusting for inflation and input prices. And when we look at the way prices are changed, I mean, I've got no time to go through this. This is London, but the, the bottom run, the bottom line is prices have not significantly increased, which means that there is not lock-in by incumbent providers. Competition is being maintained over time. And another reason why this is happening is not just because London TFL was very clever and broke up the incumbent in many, in many uh, pieces, but in, in 12 different companies creating competition ex ante, but also they made sure that the garages were dispersed. Garages are very important because they are like the fixed cost you need to have in order to operate the service. But having a, a, a dispersed uh, ownership of garages across London, they ensured that more than two to three firms in general had the garage that was cl sufficiently close to the, t to the route to be able to bid. And this is being, and we then calculated the number of minutes it takes from one garage to the route up for tender, and in fact we found that in most cases there were at least three firms that had the garage within 20 minutes from the route, so we're able to compete. Overall, this, in a sense, is not a surprise. This is considered best case in transport for, for the OECD and, and so on. So the, the, the devil is then in the detail. Competency is crucial. And, 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 uh, and to conclude, uh, I just uh, rephrase, uh, rephrase uh, recall the main points and suggestions we have. Uh, which is uh, centrally designed contracts should be used, impose the public authority to use them, and then allow modifications only if explicitly justified by the authority. Aggregate procurement of PPP, creating PPP X percent, and make sure these are accountable by imposing transparency on PPP contracts and performance. Make contracts and performance available online, uh, avoiding the abuse of commercially sensitive information, ju that just you know, justifying not uh, releasing data uh, because com commercially sensitive, which is nonsense. Use benchmarking, train public official, more competency is needed, and uh, uh, as, uh, as I remember, uh, the president of the Antitrust Anti-Corruption Authority in Italy a long time ago told us, competence is uh, the best means to fight corruption. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Yossa, and, uh, uh, and, and, and as time flows, and I invite the floor to questions, please. Yes, please. Thank you very much. My name is Irena Ivanishin, uh, EMPPIM student, 6th edition. Uh, I'm from Ukraine. Uh, 
thank you, Professor Yosef and Prof Professor Bovis for the great interest and presentation. Uh, nowadays, our world is changing faster and faster, and it's not easy to implement some long-term uh, contracts. Uh, from your perspective, uh, which is the main, uh, the other main factors um, uh, for uh, successful implementation of PPP contracts, and uh, what do you think? Uh, if uh, do they will change in the f next uh, ten years? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for the question. Um, in, in my view, the fundamental for any public contract, including a concession, a public-private partnership, or even a, a plain uh, traditional two-way contract for delivering public services, is what they call uh, the, the practitioners call the business case. If the business case is fundamentally sound, that means the specifications of the contract are clearly agreed. The standards of the contract have been allocated accordingly. We cannot buy anything unless there is reference to standards. Otherwise, the whole system will collapse. So that is the first step, specification standards in the business case. And the other thing, the other impo important aspect of ma maintaining some faithful security in delivery contracts is what is, at the moment, the Commission is obsessed with this so-called professionalization. You heard of that. You, you hear from institutional reform, we need to professionalize procurement, meaning that the procurer needs to professionalize, which means that the procurer must be more commercially oriented. Quite often, the civil servant, the person that is on the other side of the private sector, has very little idea about the market choices, about the dynamics in the market, about options, about variants, about different technologies. Therefore, he's been led into a kind of blind path. The sooner the capacity on the commercialization, risk, risk education, but mainly the plain negotiations. Would you trust your civil servant negotiating successfully at PPPs? Many member states, I asked this question to the European Parliament, many MEPs says that the normal procurer is not capable of understanding what is at stake for negotiations, let alone arriving at complete negotiations. It's economic diplomacy plus negotiations plus quite often a kind of a psychology. We don't have that at the moment at any member state, including the advanced states, Germany, France, uh, even the UK. Next one. Yes, please, the gentleman in the back row. Thank you. Uh, a question more for, for Chris and for Elizabeth, I think. Um, Chris, I think you're very optimistic when you say that contracts are only entered into if uh, they're in balance. Uh, one of the risks there is in these type of projects is usually the reputational risk which runs exclusively on, on the public side because the public sector, be it the public procurer or the politician above, are subject to certain pressures that the private operator isn't. So very often they will be under pressure to accept a worse deal than, it, they, than they would in other situations. So that is one of the risks I think has not been reflected in, in, in your presentation and in your, um, in your summary. And also another one, which uh, I think um, I've seen it happening, especially in Portugal uh, over the years, but also in the UK to a certain extent, is what I call the regulatory risk or the, the regulatory capture risk, where you have contracts that run for many years, so the people that are involved in setting it up from the public sector, then sooner or later end up on the private sector, sometimes managing the contracts that they all set up on the private side, on, on the public side, but on the private side. Yes. Okay, maybe it's more addressed to you. Yeah. One, one very, very, uh, thank you, Senor. Thank you very much for this excellent question. For reputational risk, I think it's balance between po both public and the private sector. The public sector has too much at stake because they involved about putting their stake and reputation of as an authority as a public sector delivering a complex project. 
The other side of the coin is that the private sector has a lot at stake because, not because of the consortium, because of the special purpose vehicle, but because quite often, as we'll see with some recent collapses, so for Carillion, for example, they based upon the reputation in order to win bullet points for the next job. That's why it's the, 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 the race to feed the beast with the wings. It doesn't matter how lower the margins are to deliver the project, you gotta deliver. You have to show how good that was your last race, how was your last win. That was the perverse way of mentality about managing risk. I'm optimistic because of my nature being optimistic about balancing these things. And on the reputational or relational aspects, both parties have to lose. And if both parties have to lose, then you need to balance. Then you need the imperative of equilibrium. The second question, Pedro, my, my dear friend and colleague, uh, mentions on the uh, kind of regulatory risk. This is a $64 question. Five years down the line, a new government comes and doesn't change the contract. The PPP stays as it was signed five years earlier. It changes the regulatory parameter. So a modality to deliver public services through, for example, a bridge crossing has a competitor, an underground tunnel. So people have a choice, either to cross the bridge or get the tunnel. In other words, cannot be reflected in any model. Even the most, uh, let's say, forward-thinking lawyer cannot identify this happening. Well, you can. I have tried many times forecasting regulatory risks Every time it says you're too pessimistic, take it back, we're not gonna change. But this is the most important thing. This, that's the whole thing will collapse. And you will see PPPs in Australia and Victoria, remember the, you know, the state of Victoria, completely collapsed because people didn't buy the risk allocation initially purported by the government and they selected a different route. So they didn't pay the, the toll. In Africa, it's the same. The Nigerian privatization, sort of the PPP between Lagos and um, the airport, started losing faith because people didn't use it. In fact, they didn't pay. They used different routes. Therefore, regulatorily, it's the most important risk that will collapse the PPP. Okay, can, can I say something and maybe go a little bit in a different direction? Uh, I don't believe that the reputational issues at stake are the same for two reasons. First, uh, in Europe, we are public authorities are not allowed to use, uh, to take into account uh, past performance of the contractor when they uh, consider when they consider bidding in the next tender. In some countries, like in the UK, they do it in practice. This is in the TFL, for example. Example: one of the sometimes they don't award the contract to the lowest bidder, precisely because they take into account the reputation or they want to reward an incumbent for doing particularly well. But in other countries, like in Italy, there is there has been uh, absolutely no possibility to use it. Now we know that the new direct the, the directive has gone has tried to change this a little bit, but the 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 the, the, the reputation at stake to me is very unbalanced. And in that regard, I would like to strike uh, uh, to to highlight something again about the competency. The, the paper we did looking at the effect of competency on the U.S. contra federal contracts. One of the explain we then tried to explain why was NASA so much better than the other bureaus. Okay, so what was explaining that difference in uh, in uh, competency and in, in performance? And one of the things we found were incentives within the public sector. I know about, uh, I, I don't know the details of Portugal, I know the details of other countries. Very often, public officials who do well don't get rewarded. If they don't do well because the contract goes bad, they, they get isolated or, you know, a sort of uh, um, blamed. Uh, instead, uh, incentives in the public sector should re really give the right incentives to those who, who take responsibilities and then, uh, you know, do things well to be rewarded for that. And in that regard, I think Italy is moving in one direction, which is really good, which is to introduce a system of qualification for public authorities, at least in some regards. Gustavo will, will talk about this later, but the idea that for example, you know, the PPP, as I said, I don't think it should be managed by small public authorities. There should be a central unit. 
transparency and accountability of these units should be ensured precisely because even reputational issues at stake are not balanced. Yes, uh, still have a couple of minutes. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Castro Pico, please. Now, just, uh, just uh, coming back to this last sentence by Elisabetta. So if we centralize PPP with a center of competence, and, but then we put together your example and your concern about SMEs, then you are basically uh, asking uh, this expert center to take that consideration into account and uh, provide, uh, whenever it is possible, tons of lots. Is that what you're saying? Um. When it's possible? I think, you know, even for, uh, uh, so the, the, the Transport for London case is one where they divided the, the, the city of London into many lots, and that has allowed SMEs to operate. I think, and I totally agree with you, that uh, the concern for PPP should be a policy concern, uh, and the centralization that has led to bigger countries is absolutely no good. But also because in PPP, this is particularly, in a sense, bad if we do it when it's not needed, also because it's inevitable that the firm that will run the, the show for 20 years in the contract will gain a lot of experience and expertise, and you don't want this firm to end up being totally locked in that at the next uh, at the end of the contract, the new tender will go deserted or you just see the same firm winning and winning all the time. So, I, yes, I agree, absolutely. Centralization should not go, go with uh, uh, bigger contracts at all. We need uh, as a role for SMEs to ensure competition being maintained co over time. So, l smaller lots whenever is possible. No big economies of scale and so on. oppose very strongly such kind of reform, right? Uh, he's he's going to be opposed against dismantling. So, so just for a, to name an example, in uh, what's happening in Rome at the moment, they have the big in-house provider for transport service. There is a lot of politics there. Lots of hiring was done for political reason and so on. And now there is even a referendum called by citizens where they want to have competitive tendering. We are trying more and more when we go around to say, remember that you should really divide this into lots. Uh, it's clear that you know politics is politics, and there are interests not in this, uh, in favor of division in lots. They want to favor big operators. They don't blah blah blah. Maybe just the fear that a foreign company may get uh, the tender will induce politicians to actually divide this into lots, which is uh, also a way, uh, in a sense, to ensure local firms may win. You know, a division in lots. So for competition reasons, you want to divide in lots. If there are big economies of scale, you can still deal with the, some of the, um, uh, you can still induce internalization of economies of scale by doing combinatorial auctions. All these require a lot of competency. Uh, so uh, we'll see. Yes, please. Can you uh, identify yourself in the first place? Uh, this is Hanadi Nabulsi from Jordan. My question is for Iyosa. Uh, yes, you mentioned that uh, one of the big mistakes of problems that uh, the public authority does not take the responsibility of the risk that it should bear. Yes? Or the opposite. So what do you think is the best way to define which risks? Because I think the risk is, uh, is a problem not only in the PPP even in the, in the other contracts. And uh, does it relate it also to the kind of contract or the, or the type of contract? It, it, I mean, um, yes. it may uh, go case by case. In each, in each type of contract or case, you must define a new kind of risk that the public authority should bear. Thank you. No, okay, thanks for this question because it helps me qualifying what I said. I believe, you know, whether you should transfer demand risk to the contractor who is operating a, pri a prison is something everybody in this room will agree on. Okay, the contractor has no possibility to affect through its decision how many prisoners will be in the prison. No possibility. So transferring that risk to the contractor has no effect on incentives to manage the prison better or to design it better 
All it does increases the risk premium. Maybe you know there is a drop in prisoners. Maybe there is a, an amnesty. So all it does is to increase the risk premium paid to the contractor with no consequence. The government instead makes decision that affects the prison number of people who will go to prison, so issue better risk. Everybody will agree. We just need to think about it a little bit more, but everybody will agree. So this is to say all prisons, and we also agree on this, demand risk should be retained by the public sector. Okay? Similar things can be done, at least sometimes a little bit less intuitively, in every sector for every type of project. So the risk allocation in more ways should be defined by the standardized contract. A group of experts, policy makers, uh, you know, public officials should get together and say, how should we allocate risk in motorways? Write it down in a contract, make it standardized, and that should be the leading contract. How should we allocate risk in schools? How should we allocate risk in ration se leisure centers, museums, and so on? So the risk allocation should follow the, the sector, should be by sector, by type, typology, but then be the same. Good, and uh, are there any other questions? Uh, if not, I would like to take the last one, very brief one. Uh, uh, my uh, question goes to both Professor Bovis and, uh, and Yasa, if you have some uh, uh, observation, I'll be grateful. You know, in the commercial world, uh, it is saying that the uh, principle for risk uh, you know, allocation is based on the principle that, you know, whoever can better control the risk, you know, you place the the hand, uh, whoever can better control the world. But, you know, when it comes to public sector, especially PPP, it seems the tendency is trying to, you know, transfer, you know, uh, substantial risk to, you know, to the private sector. The question is that, uh, you know, to what extent the principle of commercial risk uh, management uh, still counts, and uh, and uh, you know, if if it is, you know, uh, how to balance, you know, between between you know the commercial principle of risk management and in, and, and 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 transferring substantial risk to private sector in terms of PPPs. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you, for, thank you Chairman, for this. Uh, in my experience, all the years I've been dealing with procurement and PPP contracts, uh, risk allocation is a euphemism for increasing prices. Not because uh, the design of risk allocation is wrong or is fundamentally, conceptually ill-footed but because who drives risk allocation doesn't understand commercialism. Risk allocation underlines a sector and insurance. The insurance sector, the market financial services is based on risk. So the best advice I would give to anybody that deals with procurement contracts or PPP and concessions, study how the insurance allocates risk, how they assess risks, and how they price, what premium they put for their services to take risk for a particular period for exposure. Imagine if we had the vision to export from insurance markets into the public markets, the marché public, as they say in France, the risk mechanisms, the risk matrix, the risk methodology that purports the insurance sector for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. And for Yasa. So your, your question was who should uh, do more risk management? Yeah, the commercial principle of risk management, uh, you know, uh, is one uh, that is based on whoever, you know, could control, uh, yes. in a better position to control the risk, but uh, in the PPP, it seems, you know, you would like to move more risk to the private sector. So. So this is, uh, I think, what I've been uh, talking <laughs> about in the in the in the presentation. Uh, so one aspect is uh, yes, uh, who should manage risk better, but the other aspect is to recall that whenever you transfer risk, you're gonna pay for it. There is what is called the risk premium, what justifies 20% uh, being uh, paid more than the expected return on this PPP contract. So again, an assessment 
should be done, uh, uh, a decision should be made, I think, uh, centrally on uh, who should bear the type of risks for different sec in different, uh, by sector and by type of project in PPP. And then, uh, you know, you might consider, obviously, a motorway in the south of Italy might have bear different demand risk than a motorway in the north of Italy, so that then the level of risk may be, may be different. And this assessment uh, should be done, uh, 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 you know, before <laughs> the PPP uh, is, is chosen, because that's exactly what affects uh, uh, the risk allocation and also whether it's a good idea to do a PPP and not uh, uh, to do a traditional procurement. So, for example, the, you know, one of the things I may say, you will have heard about the, mis the bridge connecting Sicily to the mainland. So, many of us were thinking that it was a bad idea simply because the level of demand risk and the level of construction risk for that project was so high that transferring that risk in a significant way to the private sector will have been extremely costly. So then we will have had to do, to keep it in the risk in the private, in the public sector, but then it made no sense to, to sort of do that kind of complex contract with the bundling. Because doing bundling, you know, kicking out SMEs, you know, making this very long contract you're committed to for 30, 40 years makes no sense if you don't transfer risk. And that was a case where risk transfer was impossible. Then we did the worst that could happen, which is to commit, we committed ourselves to do it, and then we decided not to do it, so we kept keep paying for the, <laughs> for the uh, uh, empty shell. Um, that's when politics, unfortunately, comes before efficiency. But there are so many other good examples, even in Italy, of PPP that have worked well for motorways. There is a PPP for Bolzano prison. They seem to be doing, uh, you know, we have an expert, uh, one of the people we work with who sent me all the contract details and seem to have been done really by the book. There are PPP in leisure center and museums. You know, there is a lot of really uh, potential to be done, but we need to get now and look at the details. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, 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 we're about to come to a conclusion. I uh, appreciate it very much uh, for two distinguished professors and then uh, to deliver a wonderful uh, presentation based on theoretical, uh, both theoretical uh, framework and, uh, and, 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 and practice, uh, which uh, enriched uh, uh, as much of the understanding of particular issue risk uh, management and uh, also make uh, evidence-based uh, uh, proposals. Thank you very much. Can I also invite uh, uh, the floor to thank you uh, both again? Right. <laughs> and, uh,